Well, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Bill Annable from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Waterloo. I'm here today to talk a little bit about the experiences I've had over the last four months or so on developing lectures for online courses. I've been asked by several of my colleagues to write things down with respect to what I learned and how I did things. And in reflection upon that, I thought it would be a lot more efficient and a lot more appropriate, given the conditions and the era that we're in, to actually do a little video on that as well. So what I want to take you through are some of the experiences um, and some of the, the limitations, some of the challenges, and some of the investments with respect to taking uh, on these types of endeavors. So uh, these are also going to be a lot of recommendations based upon the experiences that I had. And the first one is with respect to your presentation construct. And that is simply the storyboard or the overall aesthetic of the screen and how you, you plan to do things. I found that um, I wanted to do something that made sure that I was still part of the engagement within the students, but I didn't want to be the central part of that uh, engagement. So on the star storyboard itself, it identifies um, uh, areas that pri the primary area is going to be the subject material we're talking about and then I'm just going to sh uh, shift myself right over into the small little box on the side then to uh, to still be present and to still uh, accentuate and to uh, acknowledge various uh, parts of the lectures but not be the central part of the discussion. Uh, brings me to an interesting aside of even choosing the background with respect to what image that I wanted to actually post on that. I wanted to choose something that was relatively familiar to the students, but I didn't actually want to actually put myself uh, in, a, in a fake lecture hall with nobody in it and pretend that I was lecturing in a lecture hall. Uh, quite, quite honestly, why go backwards in time? A lot of us might never actually want to actually go lecture in a lecture hall again, or at least not the conventional form. Um, I also didn't want to rub salt in a wound with respect to the, the students not being able to be on campus. So I wanted to choose a, a building or a location on campus that was kind of commensurate with a the theme of um, what I'm uh, talking about um, that would be a, a fairly comfortable background for the students. In this case, I chose the EIT building um, uh, on campus. A couple of the other things that uh, are in here is obviously there's some branding and the branding is there to identify what university I'm from and what department I'm from and also I teach, uh, I'm a fellow of the, the Canadian Rivers Institute so I also teach a lot of short courses through the Canadian Rivers Institute uh, and I want to use actually a lot of these uh, uh, mini lectures uh, in, in many of those discussions as well. So I want to acknowledge all of those uh, different uh, organizations. The main pre presentation space is obviously the one where most of the notes are going to be residing, the discussions, and I use, typically we'll, we'll, we'll be doing things by inking uh, in most of my notes just because I, I found that was a very effective format. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the application or the execution of that uh, in the development of a script, which we'll talk about in a little while. And then there's this funny little area that seems to be uh, at the top that I could never figure out exactly what to do, uh, this blank bl uh, box area. And I, what I recognized as I was actually doing the lectures is spoken missing. Uh, in other words, misspeaking, but I could actually use that little message board at the top to actually correct some of the statements so I didn't have to go back and re-record things. And it also, I think, added a little bit of levity with respect to uh, some of the discussions that, that we were having. So some of the uh, video ideas that I experienced and, and what I'm always interested in is trying to, uh, well in the middle of a, a, a typical lecture or a conventional lecture, I'd always be um, uh, pausing at various times and saying, oh I wish I could have brought that uh, picture into this discussion or this video clip um, or, or been able to augment this uh, on the fly. And I've actually found, with respect to uh, undertaking the, uh, the video lectures, I can do, in fact, that. So it, it provides a really great and robust environment with respect to uh, integrating a whole bunch of things together. But there's a few other thing, little things that I learned. The first one is, at least within the notes that you're actually including within the videos, I would recommend that you, you avoid numbering them. And the reason for that is that if you want to, uh, for instance, change the order of your various little mini lectures uh, in the future, well then you can do that and it, it's kind of a, a flawless 
a, a format between them without page numbers being shuffled between each of the many little lectures. Um, so it provides some continuity that is then uh, in the future, even if you want to use them in different courses, you're not going to be, uh, be all jumbled up on page numbers. Correspondingly, the same thing for video numbers. I chose not to actually put embed within the videos themselves uh, mini lecture or lecture or discussion number one or two or three. I, I would still include those in the file names, but then I, of course I can more easily change the file name and actually change, go in and actually change the, the, the video clips within the, the mini lectures themselves. I also incorporated a tagline with respect to my uh, mini lectures, and I didn't actually call them lectures because I think we might be actually evolving away from that kind of uh, uh, pedagogy with respect to how we have delivered uh, information in the past. So given that I'm in the water field, uh, a couple of my children contributed to the concept and I ended up uh, starting to call them all droplets. So droplet 1 through droplet 55 uh, evolved out of this term. Um, it, it just, uh, I, I found it a little bit more uh, endearing with respect to uh, uh, the, the presentation rather than calling them formal lectures. Uh, a couple of the other things that I uh, identified was probably one of the most critical things with respect to uh, the whole uh, development of the, the videos is to develop a script. And what that really entails is that you, you have your course notes in whatever fashion that you want to record them and transcribe that information. But then also take the time to think about, oh, well, after the fact, when I'm in pr producing the videos, I could insert this video or I can insert this picture or I can annotate this graph or, or whatever it is and think about which possible graphs that you want to actually include and then just jot down in your, uh, in your physical script that's sitting beside me here of what those uh, introductions are so then you can actually talk about them rather freely as you're doing the video uh, as if it's a seamless part of the whole presentation uh, and you can include those things l later on and then you can actually even time the introduction of your photos or your videos or annotations uh, coincident with the, with the speech and the delivery of the material as you're going through it. A few of the other uh, things that I identified was um, uh, and this was always out of a personal um, uh, pet peeve of mine, which identified, I always hated when I w would be referencing a figure or an equation or something, and then backpedaling through various pages to find that so I could remind the students of actually what that equation or figure was. Here what I can do is just take a, a simple print screen of actually that particular page or part of that the video that I've taken and actually uh, put that in as a picture or a dr with a drop shadow in it uh, that can highlight actually for, for the students for the recall of where that information came from, uh, what part of actually the lecture it came from, and then how that's connecting to the current material. So it, it uh, kind of minimizes how much back and forth within your presentation that you actually have to do. Um, a few other things that I, I discovered was uh, not using static graphs, but actually I could liven up a graph. So what I would do is I might have multiple lines in a graph and what I realized is that well I could make a small video of actually the graph beforehand and then just choose different lines on the graph as, as different layers and, and kind of time them as they were introduced and have a video of that and then as I'm recording the video I have off to the side on a monitor uh, that video playing so I can narrate the introduction of that graph as it's evolving or developing rather than just a single static uh, graph and then spending more time trying to point out which each line meant. This way it's introducing each line as it goes along. It's a lot more effective way with respect to trying to to build the concepts of a graph into your discussion. The other thing that I started doing a few years ago, and introducing them into my physical hard notes copies, um, uh, we're using QR codes so I could actually link to either other sources of media such as YouTube, or I also started developing some other small videos that were more theoretical development. So, for example, if there was a concept that would have come forward from a different course, I could say oh, it can be shown, and when I'm doing my video editing, I would use the, the the cue, the audio cue from it could be shown to put up a QR code that would then link to maybe some theoretical development or a YouTube video or another uh, source of, of, of um, a problem that's being solved so that I'm not consuming more time 
going backwards with the information, but I'm actually giving the students a link to actually go forward and using that on their own. And since they can actually scan the QR code with their phone, they have the, the ability then to actually use that uh, material uh, remotely on their phone, or then they can just copy the link and then watch that on, on their computer wherever they so choose. And the other uh, aspect that I spent considerable time actually on and a lot of creativity on was fusing field work and showing the data acquisition and transition phase, whether that was collecting GPS data out in the field, showing what that represented within, for instance, a cross section, and in my case, looking at rivers or, or, or conditions like that, showing students different pieces of technology, for example, of how you could use things, reminding them from other courses of how they've done things in the past and, and how that's being utilized in this course, um, or even showing them uh, more abstract co concepts of changes within uh, flood flow conditions and, and, and how particles and, and fluid mechanics actually change as a fact of actually anthropogenic uh, alterations within the landscape itself. So they became a source of creativity and of different ways of actually uh, fusing different aspects of media and creativity together to actually build a more holistic and complete reflection of actually the, the course content so that hopefully the students were gaining a lot more out of that experience. The pedagogy that I actually uh, used kind of followed a, a series of mini lectures, but what I was concerned about was feedback or the lack thereof. So what the, the approach that I developed was at the end of not every mini lecture, and each of these uh, mini lectures were approximately 20 minutes in length. Some uh, probably a half a dozen pushed towards uh, 35 minutes in length to finish off an entire thought within a video. Um, but how I approached this was at the end of a mini lecture there would actually be two or three really simple short quick answer quick uh, uh, response questions for the students that would be either multiple choice or multi-select or something uh, within our the the uh, the teaching environment and the delivery system that we have and at the University of Waterloo that happens to be the desire to learn platform um, and whereby the students would answer two or three different questions and then they would have to answer those questions before the next uh, mini lecture was released so that they would then be able to proceed on to the next mini lecture and then maybe another set of uh, two or three questions. So it would emulate the question and answer responses that you would get in a class. The other benefit of doing things like that I found was that I could actually track the progress of students, see who were kind of consistently working through the classes versus other students that were, uh, were banking their time in, towards what, whatever the quizzes or the larger quizzes were and then blitzing all those in, in kind of a larger condensed set. So we'd go through a series of mini lectures and they usually range between Eight, uh, 18 to 25 of these mini lectures and then we would actually have a module quiz that would benchmark a series of those lectures with typically two or three major topics within each one of those modular quizzes and then we would go on to the next quiz. The final quiz which was originally designed to actually be within the 12 week um, semester period or the trimester period uh, I've pushed that actually into the final exam uh, period simply because there was just to, everything was too condensed within the 12 week period. The other thing that I was very mindful was was to use accessible software and being mindful of the fact that if you use proprietary software that can, can be very beneficial for classes but if you're working in a remote area that either you have limited internet access or absolutely no internet access um, using something that was relatively simple such as Excel in this case uh, not as eloquent as uh, various uh, lang uh, computer languages, but it actually taught all of the, the fundamentals and the processes sufficiently to actually convey all the topics within the course. The other part of that being mindful with respect to accessible software is I, I also thought that this uh, these courses could actually be used uh, in developing countries where people would be interested in various topics uh, and also possibly have uh, notable limitations with respect to access to any type of advanced software. So I wanted to keep the, the software advances relatively limited. So as the equipment goes, this is my studio. 
So my studio is my workshop, uh, which is relatively simplistic. Uh, it, it does the job. Um, it has all the components that I need. What, uh, what I have in here is I have a green screen behind me. I have two, three actual lights. I have a, a, an LED light above me and an LED, LED light at the bottom of the green screen, and they're both to backlight the, the green screen itself. That's something that's quite important because if, if it's a relatively consistent backlighting on the green screen, that color is easy to remove on the software that I was using with respect to the, uh, the development of the videos. Uh, laptop stand, so it's a little bit easier to script on the laptop. Uh, a microphone stand with a filter. The filter, um, I have a tendency of doing this. Or pausing and then there's the the, um, the auditory response off of that so the filter helped a lot and also a little bit of audio editing uh, removed some of those as well uh, a webcam I know that many people are actually using uh, relatively fancy uh, high resolution cameras uh, this was a, a, a webcam that was relatively inexpensive uh, that worked quite well um, the other things that were actually beneficial was I initially uh, invested in a a small eight and a half inch or 8.9 inch um, circular light that goes around the webcam to just highlight uh, me um, just so that it would remove a lot of the shadows off of my face and things. I'm not much to look at, but I'm even worse to look at when there's no light. Um, that small light in itself probably broke within a week or so, so I actually invested in something that was a little bit more uh, expensive and that's actually been a, a worthwhile investment as well. Uh, microphone that, that I have is a, a Yeti Blue microphone, which is actually a, quite a, a decent quality microphone for, for the lectures. And a couple of, uh, obviously that I have a laptop, which is a Lenovo Yogo 4, which allows me to, to ink on the screen itself, which provided a lot of benefits um, with respect to interacting with, with the lectures and advancing the information. Um, in the theory within that. A couple of extras that aren't really needed, um, but I picked up a pair of, of Jabra um, uh, in-ear earbuds, which were quite uh, beneficial, particularly when it came to editing videos, as the ones that go on over top of your ears get, as probably all of you know, get quite hot. And the two shop lights that you can pick up at any box store with respect to the backlighting. So all in all, other than the laptop, total for all that stuff was somewhere in the range of about $880 or $900. Uh, recording. Try to record things uh, when the ambient background noise at wherever you are recording are relatively tranquil. So I would turn off the furnace, I would turn off the sump pump, I'd uh, ask my family not to turn on the washing machine or the dishwasher or even flush the toilet. There happens to be a drain right above me and when the toilet was flushed it would be like Niagara Falls coming over the, microwave, uh, uh, the microphone. So I avoided all of those uh, circumstances. That just takes a little bit of planning, uh, whether it be while well, everybody's out shopping or going up for a walk or maybe I'm recording at 4 o'clock in the morning to avoid everybody. All those times were then adaptable. The other thing is be familiar with your space. I have about this much room to work with to if I want to uh, make hand gestures to communicate some of the points. If you happen to be a, a loud hand signal talker, nobody can understand what's going on with your hands past the, the limits of your, your small box. So get to know the limits of your, of your box with respect to if you want to express yourself. Um, be aware, I became keenly aware of ticks. Um, as I mentioned, that I have the tendency to stop and pause, and then there's that little uh, uh, snapping of the of the lips that I found was very very irritating, particularly in the post production assessment. So you become uh, aware of your own personal ticks, uh, which words that you typically repeat yourself with. I think as faculty members we have a tendency to repeat ourselves to a certain extent as we're trying to usually solicit feedback from the class with respect to various questions that we've asked. This is an environment where we don't need to do that so we can be laser focused on the delivery of the information rather than having all those other gestures or, or, or time legs with respect to waiting for, for feedback. Students can simply press the rewind button. Um, and that leaves me with the, 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 the point of being concise is because we don't need to repeat ourselves, there is no class to actually gain an auditory response to that we can 
we can provide a lot more of a very focused uh, discussion w without all the other feedback or, or nuances or, or going off on a tangent of t telling students a story and things like that. We can stay right on, on topic on these things. Uh, and then it's up to the student to choose how much of us that we they want to listen to or not. Um, video production summary. So in total for this class that I produced uh, for this 36 hour class, I produced 23 hours and 50 minutes of uh, videos. And initially I was concerned about the, the lack of not hitting the 36 hour mark with respect to producing videos. But then if we recognize that within any 60 minute video or 60 minute lecture, well, you only actually have a 50-minute class, which then uh, relates down to 30 hours of, of lecture time net for a 12-week uh, a um, lecture cycle. And then if you take five minutes per class for questions and answers, that's down to 27 hours for the term. And then most of us spend a few minutes queuing the students up with respect to what they learned in the last lecture and winding down at the end of the lecture. So if, if you assume that you use about five minutes for that, we're approximately at the 24-hour limit with respect to the delivery of the media. So I, th I think that the delivery of the content that I was providing was pretty much on the mark and with respect to time. And actually the content that was being delivered uh, was approximately 210 pages of content that, that, that I completed that content comfortably within that 24-hour period because I, I wasn't distracted by answering questions or, or, or having to, to provide other uh, insights. Um, the other thing that because of those QR codes and links that I actually provided, there was an additional uh, one hour and 20 minutes of external uh, audio and, uh, and media that was actually used to uh, complement and augment the course materials as well. So that brings us to timing. Uh, with respect to if any of you are worried about that you don't have enough time to start this. Well, I purchased Camtasia, which is by TechSmith, on April t uh, 16th, 2020, and I played around with it for two or three days. I'd used some other types of software before that, but found that Camtasia was really providing the, the uh, all of the benefits uh, and the, the outlets that I was looking for with respect to some type of a media production uh, software package. So classes started on May 11th. I had three weeks to build courses uh, before that. Um, so I had three weeks of lectures prepared by the time that lectures started. By the time lectures completed, just actually this, this week, that it took me, I was starting to lag behind the course a little bit where at the, the uh, lectures wouldn't get out first thing on a Monday morning. Sometimes they would have gotten out in the last couple weeks of lectures by the Wednesday afternoon. But all in all, very doable with respect to actually condensing everything in within a single term. Now, resource commitment, which I'm sure everybody is uh, kind of curious about, is that in addition to actually what I had done, I chose to invest fully in this experience. I recognized it was a direction that I've been wanting to go for a while, which is leading towards a flipped classroom environment. Um, so I was, had been preparing myself, at least mentally, to do this for, for uh, a period of time. So the resource commitment might seem a little daunting at first, but keep in mind of all the other components that I did. Uh, the, you obviously don't need to do all of those. So what we actually had in here was, uh, when I, and I did keep track of my hours for this, so I averaged typically between 65 to 70 hours per week developing this course. But that also included a full rewrite of the course notes, which were 260 pages, which was also I fully updated and made my own figures for everything and as well as new examples for everything, because I was also worried about copyright. So anything that I did, I just decided that I was going to update the entirety of the, all of the course notes so I did not have to, to endeavor upon any issues with respect to copyright. Now, there were uh, a few pictures that I included that I did not have in, in my repertoire and of course those were referenced uh, as I went along but those are probably about 10 pictures over the, the 200 plus pages. Um, that part itself I would estimate that that took me approximately 60 percent of the time or approximately 40 hours per week. And script development. So this was the really important part. So you have the detailed course notes, 
everything that you wanted to include in there. And then I selectively went through and removed things, as many of us do, so that I could ink it back in again so the students could follow along. That also guaranteed that the students would actually have to uh, invest in watching the videos to augment their, their course notes so they could actually learn more from the, the completeness of the course, course notes rather than just the, the, the bare bones elements with respect to what was in their, uh, their version of the course notes. It also then uh, allowed me the opportunity to then be creative and think about, well, which pictures do I want to, uh, to include? And I would just simply draw a box and say, I want to put in this river picture or think about or talk about you know, this concept, and then I can add in the annotations and the figures later on. So that script development itself took about somewhere between 5 to 10% of the time, or approximately 5 hours per week. Now the video recording itself, that kind of was on a sliding scale. As my mother reminded me the other day is the fact that I even hate getting my picture taken. So to actually stand up in front of a video a camera and actually do this for hours on end, I was very uncomfortable with it. Still am uncomfortable with it, but I'm a little bit more comfortable with it now than I was when I started. So when I started, things took a long time probably to just do the recording stuff and not stumbling over my words all the time. It took me probably uh, 15 or 20 takes to actually get it going. Um, and the, the mode which I like to actually present in is for these 20 minute lectures I don't like to stop and start through them and, and edit them together. I like it to be a continuous discussion and dialogue thought. So it was usually the first two or three minutes of getting things out of my mouth that actually were the hardest and after that that uh, I would get more into a, a more of a typical lecture discussion mode and then things kind of flowed. So in the beginning I might be making uh, one uh, video take per day for example and towards the end, I was actually recording three or four videos uh, in, in a morning, and then I was uh, editing them in the afternoon. So that part uh, typically was around 10% to 15% of my time, or about 10 hours a week. And then the video production itself was and that also evolved as you became more familiar with the software, and that typically ranged around 15% to 20%, 25% of my time. And so in other words, about 15 hours a week. And what I would typically do is I would go through the video, do all my annotations, bring in the media that I wanted, and then I would re-go through a second time to uh, audit for any audio deficiencies, so particularly my little tick, but also, then I would be monitoring what I was saying so that I could develop the questions for the mini uh, quizzes that were after each of the, the mini lectures. So that's kind of a summary of my experience uh, as it relates to developing videos for the term. I consider this to be a centerpiece of a flip, flip uh, classroom environment for several years to come. So I significantly invested within this resource as I saw it as an opportunity to do things uh, differently for the re rest of or several years to come. And if asked, would I do this again? The answer is absolutely. I'm actually doing it again because there's another course to be taught. Take care and good luck.